This episode is brought to you by Jeremiah's Butte Bricks. Hey, Mom, can we stop at Tchotchkes to get some micro krill cubes? No, honey, we have micro krill cubes at home. Hey, kid, are you sick of the off brand micro krill cubes that your parents bring home from the store? How did you get into our car? Well, I have good news. If you want the experience of eating quality food, but at a price your parents will find pleasing, have them look into Jeremiah's Butte Bricks. Thanks to the lack of bothersome government regulations and a recent windfall of only mildly aged micro krill, Jeremiah is able to pass on the savings to you. Do they taste like the cubes they have at the restaurants? Thanks to our proprietary processes, Jeremiah's Butte Bricks taste like nothing at all. They're the perfect protein source. Are they healthy? I don't think you'll find any evidence that they aren't. Mom, can we stop and get some Butte Bricks from the grocery store? That's it, Timmy. Good on ya. My name's Aiden. Sure it is. Remember, folks, if you're looking for Butte Bricks but don't have the cash, Jeremiah is here to help. His bricks are found in most quality groceries and corner petrol stations. Go get your cubes tonight. As one of the more infamous planets of the periphery, Butehold's story is a complicated one. Though best known as a haven for pirates and as a staging ground for military shenanigans, this warm planet on the edge of settled space has had a long and quite humbled history. The people who settled on Butehold share a lot in common with many others who headed out into the periphery. Some were seeking independence from control of others, some were seeking opportunity or even their fortune, some were refugees from war. Still others embraced the sense of adventure and excitement that comes from living at the edge of civilization. But no matter their motivation or goals, Butehold represents a chance to build a new life far from the trials and tribulations of other worlds. How successful those ventures were would depend upon time and circumstance. Amongst the democratic nations, new families are constantly springing up, others are constantly falling away, and all that remain change their condition. The woof of time is every instant broken and the track of generations effaced. Those who went before are soon forgotten and of those who will come after, no one has any idea. The interest of man is confined to those in close propinquity to himself. Butehold is the third planet of seven in orbit around a G8V star, which is roughly equivalent to Terra's yellow orange sun. The planet is roughly the size of Terra, with a surface gravity of just 2% more intense. It lacks a moon and, as a result, a large, shallow, salty seas, which make up 43% of the planet's surface, remain stagnant without a strong tidal pole. Butehold's atmospheric composition and pressure are Terran equivalent, which is considered a significant blessing for possible future settlement when it was first discovered. The planet is dominated by a single large landmass called Thorline, which makes up 57% of the planet's surface. It straddles the planet's equator, which has an average temperature of 39 degrees centigrade, which is pretty darn warm. It's rendered most of the continent a rocky and dry desert biome. The first recorded human settlement on Butte Hold was in 2597 when a small group of ichthyologists and aquaculturalists traveled from Apollo with the goal of developing the planet's highest forms of life, which were various fish and micro krill which thrived in the warm, salty waters of the planet's seas. Now, in order to understand the first settlement of Butte Hold, we need to go back 6,000 years to the earliest days of micro krill consumption. What? What's that? Okay, okay, my legal team says I need to take him to the park today to play, so we don't have time for the history lesson on micro krill farming. Just accept that they're small and look like little shrimp. The original plan was to develop the native life of the seas of Butehold using selective breeding from similar outside life forms to create a species suitable for farming. Creating a reliable protein-rich food source which had nearly infinite scalability on the otherwise barren planet on the edge of the periphery was a huge opportunity to make quite a bit of cash. The entrepreneurial researchers picked a rocky rhyolite butte overlooking the Selenide Sea on the north coast and built their research station. That site also ended up the inspiration for the planet's name, Butte Hold. Sorry if you were hoping for something a little bit more scandalous, but we'll get to that later. Though the fantasies of widespread farming of the planet's ocean animals never really materialized, it did end up being productive enough to provide food for the trickle of settlers that arrived in the decades following the first arrivals. The micro krill that were farmed proved to be almost entirely tasteless and hard to consume in anything but a compressed bar form, 
These protein-dense cubes of pressed krill became known as butte bricks in what I can only describe as an act of marketing divine inspiration. Roughly 20 years after the first settlement, the planet was claimed by the Rimworld's Republic, though in what would become a pattern, the political designation hardly impacted the lives of the people who had made Butte hold their home. With no real economy to speak of and few resources discovered, there was little need for government bureaucrats or corporations to arrive and muck everything up. Unfortunately, the lack of any government oversight or really any sight at all made Butte hold a tantalizing target for less than reputable individuals and organizations that sought to avoid being seen. When dropships could arrive and leave from the planet's surface without anyone noticing, several criminal organizations moved into the remote regions of the equatorial desert that makes up so much of Thorline. One of those criminal organizations was known as the Cavemen. This band of ne'er-do-wells set up shop near major settlements and focused on raiding those settlements for supplies only to disappear into the planet's well-known but only rarely explored limestone caves found within rocky outcroppings across the desert. There were a few attempts to set up mining operations over the years, particularly among the selenium and tellurium salt beds found in choice locations across the continent. Unfortunately, between the modest profits of such ventures and the increased hostility of the cavemen and other bandit groups, the Rimworld's Republic bureaucrats started considering the possibility of forcibly moving all of Butehold's residents off-world and abandoning the planet to the brigands. Someone must have pointed out just how much that would have cost, because what they did instead was far more disastrous for the residents of Butehold. In what is strangely called the Butehold Compromise of 2640, the Rimworld's Republic announced that they would no longer be providing any security for the planet and anyone who decided to stay was on their own. For nearly a century, the planet was left to its own devices and the people there struggled to survive with the resources they could produce on the planet. There was very little commercial jump ship traffic through the system and even when one did jump into the system, there was little need or desire to send a dropship to Butehold. There was a hyperpulse generator, but it was not staffed and basically in a dormant state once the Rimworld security forces left the planet. It basically fell off the map until 2742 when the planet ended up playing an unlikely role in the constant squabbling between the great houses of the Inner Sphere. As a planet of marginal survivability without any space traffic, defense force, or even a functioning spaceport, Butehold was the perfect location for the staging of mercenary forces paid for by the Draconis Combine. From there, attacks could be launched on the Lyran Commonwealth planets and no one would be able to trace them back to the Combine. At least that was the plan. The attack on the edge in Lyran space created a lot of headlines as the Holovids showing a well-equipped military unit killing hundreds of civilians and stealing large quantities of raw materials spread across the inner sphere. Eventually, the Lyrans were able to sort out that the mercenaries were operating out of Butte Hold and the 12th Lyran regulars and a Lyran intelligence team were sent to root out the mercenaries there. For the first time in its history, the planet was the stage for a significant battle as the Lyrans wiped out a regiment of mercenaries. After extensive interrogation of the mercenary survivors, the Lyrans discovered the Draconis Combine had funded the whole operation. When the topic was brought up at the Star League High Council, the Lyran Archon laid out the intelligence gathered and demanded the Combine Coordinator respond to the charges. The Coordinator was nonplussed and replied that business is business. This response was less than satisfactory to the Lyran Archon and a fistfight broke out between the two men. The incident triggered waves of bandit hunting across the Inner Sphere, when in fact it was actually just the Great Houses taking opportunities to sponsor attacks on border worlds and respond to such attacks from the other side in overzealous ways. Sometimes called the Phony War or the Third Hidden War, this squabbling only underlined the growing mistrust between the Great Houses, even under the banner of the Star League. Thankfully, after the destruction of the mercenary unit, Butehold dropped off the radar and wasn't subject to the trials and tribulations of interstellar politics for quite a while. In 2754, the planet was identified by the Department of Mega Engineering, or DOME, as a likely candidate for terraforming to improve both the planet's environment for living things, while also having a low enough population that anything that went wrong with the experimental technology wouldn't really matter. I'm sure this was sold to the locals in a more diplomatic way, if they were contacted at all. DOME was created during the Terran Alliance days to explore the possibility of terraforming planets to make them more hospitable. Thanks to the Kearney Fuchsia jumpship technology that was discovered and the number of already Earth-like habitable worlds could be reached vastly increased, the Dome projects lost some of their value. 
terraforming projects like Venus and Mars were increasingly seen as money sinks without prospect of sizable financial return, even in the longest of runs. Still, the organization continued to operate in hopes of bringing marginally habitable worlds closer to viability. This included redirecting water-bearing comets to dry worlds, microbe seeding, atmospheric manipulation, and even setting up a system of solar shades to reduce global temperatures. When it came to Butte Hold, the vast equatorial desert looked to be perfect for Dome's new terraforming technology. The SLDF would be on site to provide security, and there was no local government to complain or spy on what was going on. What isn't super clear is the specific technology that was actually installed on the site, though there would be hints as to the intended impact of it many years later. Unfortunately for Dome, the periphery uprising in the SLDF Civil War would end up throwing a wrench into their terraforming efforts. The site ended up being abandoned, along with most of the equipment, as it seemed like humanity was destined to destroy itself with yet another civilization-threatening war. Time and circumstance destroyed off-planet records, and the site was largely forgotten. The shifting sands of the desert covered up the rest. Still, stories of a long-lost SLDF site persisted among the locals, and some treasure hunters spent a great deal of time and money trying to locate it. Promises of a butte hold with a much more comfortable environment turned into rumors and then legends as time passed. With the destruction of the Rimworld's Republic and the death of the Star League, butte hold was forgotten as well. The major inner sphere houses had a first succession war to wage and no one cared about some backwater planet with fewer than 200,000 residents. Left to fend for themselves, the law-abiding citizens were forced to build their own security forces. However, those weren't armed with anything larger than antique pistols and garage-produced rifles. In 2865, some prospectors stumbled upon a mercenary cache of SLDF-era munitions, rations, and pistols. Other discoveries made during the short-lived gold rush of desert searching resulted in almost 100% of the population carrying small arms on a daily basis. It was both a way to discourage lawlessness and to defend from bandits, as well as becoming a bit of a cultural tradition. A saying that spread beyond the planet read, Welcome to Butte Hold. Here is your gun, here is your ammo, and the hole in the desert where you'll end up is yours to find. I need this on a t-shirt. CGL, get on this. This is a huge opportunity. Unfortunately, this is where the story of Butte Hold takes a darker turn. In 3018, a former battalion commander named Red Jack Ryan arrived in a dropship and it would forever change the planet's destiny. Ryan was on the run from half the inner sphere following an incident on America border world where he and his soldiers had taken the opportunity to sack and loot the major cities, enslave thousands of people, and caused untold amounts of damage to industry and infrastructure. The destruction of a fusion power plant ended up poisoning the planet's atmosphere, killing countless residents. Naturally, House Merrick and his now former employer, the Oberon Confederation, were eager to capture Ryan and bring him to justice. Setting up in some of the same tunnel and cave networks that the caveman bandits had hundreds of years before, Red Jack Ryan and his soldiers turned pirate and built themselves into a regional menace. With battle mechs and armored vehicles, Ryan held undisputed power over the local populace of Butte Hold. Kidnappings, random acts of terrorism, and degeneracy ran rampant. With two battalions at hand, Ryan launched raids into the Lyran and Combine territory, and each time they brought back hostages to discourage any punitive response. Ryan has been described as arrogant, narcissistic, and was likely a psychopath considering his complete disregard for the pain and suffering of others. In an open letter sent to the Admiral in charge of the Lyran Periphery Forces, Ryan wrote, Sir, I have received your communication of last month in which you state your intention to hunt down, pen up, eradicate, and ultimately destroy myself and my band of fellow privateers. As an aside, sir, may I respectfully point out that I prefer to be called a Corsair. Yes, I rather fancy that. The term pirate is such a widely misused and hackneyed term these days. At any rate, as to your letter, I welcome the opportunity to meet you in deep space. But please do not be too slow in coming to me. You see, sir, I have a special reception already planned for you and yours. If you are not soon in coming, I shall have no alternative but to come looking for you. I have long fancied to visit Tharkad before I die. Indeed, more than once I have considered the acquisition of a large palace on one of the Archon's smaller estates for use as a memorial brothel in my honor. I much enjoy the thought of leaving behind something of lasting value. So please come, bring your fleet and your battle mechs and your troopers. We are waiting for you, 
Ah, uh, but do plan to stay a long time. A very long time. Ryan's unbridled aggression and willingness to threaten the use of chemical warfare scared regional authorities out of directly attacking Ryan on Butte Hold. As a result, the piracy only intensified and dropships full of loot and treasure landed on the planet. Some of it used to make the pirates' lives more comfortable, but much of it was also buried in desert caches. Red Jack Ryan's reign of terror only intensified after his marriage to Maria Morgan. Together, they formed a larger bandit kingdom called the Greater Valkyrie, and instead of tempering with age, Ryan and Morgan only became more degenerate and violent. With the Lyrans and Combine disinterested in committing the troops necessary to finally put an end to the pirate kingdom, it would take a much more dangerous threat to finally end his reign of terror. In September of 3049, dropships of unknown type and bearing symbols none of the locals or pirates had ever seen before descended upon Butte Hold. Stomping from the ramps, the warriors of the Bronze Keshik of the Clan Wolf Gamma Galaxy were less than impressed by what they found. Under Red Jack Ryan's leadership, Butte Hold was in even worse shape than before Kerensky had left the Inner Sphere with his Exodus fleet. The pirates put up a paltry resistance but were quickly crushed and instead of playing the role of conquerors, the wolves found themselves delivering much needed food to a borderline starving populace. The people eagerly accepted clan control as the previous administration had been an utter nightmare. Butte Hold stands as one of those interesting examples of how it was possible that everyday lives of people ended up actually improving under clan leadership. All thanks to Red Jack Ryan. While these wolves played peacekeepers and provided aid on Butte Hold, Clan Jade Falcon forces completely obliterated what was left of the Greater Valkyrie, thoroughly ending pirate activity in the region for years. Say what you want about the clans, but they sure do know how to deal with piracy. It's just sad it took 450 years since the first settlement for the colony to have a genuine opportunity to thrive with the resources and security necessary to pull it off. With clan-grade technology, food production, and water purification processes set up, conditions were improved to the point that the population of Butte Hold were lifted from the constant state of scarcity. With enough food and water for people to start doing things beyond hunting, gathering, and subsistence farming, some of the population began looking for those Red Jack Ryan caches of goods buried in the desert. One of them, Eli Yonker, became a hero to the people after he discovered 50,000 cubic meters of clean water sequestered by Ryan. Instead of trying to sell it or hoarding it for himself, Yonker created an oasis for travelers and traders. He made sure that access to the water was free to anyone who needed it. And after operating the Yonkers oasis for six months, Clan Wolf even assigned a point of Salama Elementals to provide security. And as a reminder to everyone, the clan had a hand in keeping this tremendous resource available and safe. Tough for a pirate to make a living these days. The clanners, that's what they call themselves, or, or near enough hit all the big players. Belt Pirates, Butte Hold, the Valkyrie, Oberon, there's nobody left. Of course, that just means new opportunities for yours truly. Trick is finding them. Not many pickings in this area of space anymore. Clanners have got lots of other periphery worlds sewn up tight, keeping the people and the plunder for themselves. Shipping traffic is way down too. Bad news must travel fast, no one wants to come out here for fear of the clan war machine. The only ships that land anymore are full of refugees. The ones who got away before the clanners locked down their conquered planets. Never figured I'd be one of them. Over the next three decades, Butte Hold developed independently from the trials and tribulations of the Inner Sphere. The conflict between the clans and the great houses of the Inner Sphere passed the little planet by, and the only major political change, if it could be called that, was a transition of control from Clan Wolf to Clan Hell's Horses. However, much like with previous political changes, the everyday people of the planet were largely disinterested and unimpacted. The word of Blake's kerfuffle also passed the planet by, and Butte Hold ended up being one of the few safe havens out there from the chaotic 3060s and 70s. By the 3080s, the Hell's Horses were much more focused on their productive planets closer to the Inner Sphere, and there was very little in the way of security provided. Though interestingly, the point of Clan Wolf Elementals that was left with the Oasis stayed behind when the clan left, forming a quickly growing group they called the Council of Water, which took on the responsibility of protecting and distributing clean water across the desert to anyone who needed it. Now I've mentioned it here because it's important to remember not everything in the Battletech universe has to be about war and destruction. As the Hell's Horses moved inward toward Terra, the planets left behind organized into a new Oberon Confederation. 
When the representative from this new entity showed up on Butte Hold with a plan of adding the planet to the Confederation, there wasn't an official planetary government for negotiations. The vote that brought Butte Hold into the fold was reported to be just 12 people surrounding the planetary HPG who showed up after hearing about an offer for free booze and complimentary time at a brothel. Ah, democracy at its finest. Again, the change in political affiliation meant very little to the people of Butte Hold. A paper currency was introduced, which was interesting as the planet had no trees, and items made out of paper were a novelty. The paper currency was much more likely to end up used for a wide variety of purposes other than as money. The new Oberon Confederation quickly learned that adding Butte Hold to their list of planets was not going to be an economic benefit, and soon the representatives left, as so many others had before them. Once again, Butte Hold was on its own. In 3149, the longtime rumors of an SLDF dome project on Butte Hold resulted in renewed interest when someone at Interstellar Expeditions ran across them. An archaeological team was dispatched in hope of finding the site and possibly uncovering some lost tech from the Star League era. Snord's irregulars were contracted to provide security for the archaeological team as Butte Hold's reputation had not completely faded from the Red Jack Ryan years. Upon arrival, the dome site was eventually located. The team frantically tried to sort out what was salvageable and what was not when the Snord's irregular security force detected an inbound Hell's Horses trinary. Apparently, the Hell's Horses, under the leadership of Star Captain Baryogin, was pursuing a band of pirates from the Oberon Confederation and stumbled upon the Interstellar Expeditions team. While Snord's irregulars sought to delay the clan force as long as possible, the archaeological team worked as quickly as they could at the dig site uncovering what appeared to be a complete, yet dormant, terraforming device. Lacking an understanding of what exactly it was or what it did, the team apparently activated it in their attempt to gain access to all of the computer systems. As the Interstellar Expedition team fled to their dropship, the mercenaries and clanners engaged on a sandy desert battlefield that was rapidly degrading into a sandstorm, then an ionizing hurricane as a massive low-pressure system engulfed a large portion of the hemisphere, drawing in rainwater and wind from the briny oceans. Eventually, both Snord's Irregulars and the Hell's Horses had to retreat lest they be washed away in a torrent of rain and flooding. The dome site ended up at the bottom of a brand new inland sea, and the topography of the continent was significantly impacted. Though both parties to the event quickly left, the long-term impact to Butte hold from the activation of the terraforming device remains unknown. With the collapse of the Republic of the Sphere and the rise of the Ill Clan, it's unlikely that anyone from the Inner Sphere will be inclined to go check and find out anytime soon. That may be perfectly fine for the residents of Butte Hold, who will likely continue to live as they have lived for half of millennia. Now this video is a bit of an experiment to see if there's a taste for this sort of deep dive in some of the planets of the Battletech universe. If you enjoyed it and want to see more, let me know, and perhaps share the video link to someone else who might enjoy it as well. I would like to spend more time highlighting some of the wacky and wild planets out there, which are as, as interesting as any battle mech or battle. If you think the video was worthy, let me know by hitting the like and even subscribe button so that I can see the little number go up and enjoy the happy brain chemicals. An additional thanks to channel members who have taken that extra step and are directly supporting the creation of these videos. You're awesome and I really appreciate it. Until we meet again, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.